You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a PhD holding historian, a professor, and the creator of History That Doesn't Suck, a podcast that makes legit, seriously researched American history come to life through entertaining stories. Join me for a chronological telling of the United States story, from the revolution to fractious civil war, tenacious inventors, brave reformers, and more. With more than 100 episodes, you can already binge listen your way from 1776 to the early 20th century. Listen to History That Doesn't Suck on Spotify. Thanks for tuning in to episode 56 of our Civil War podcast. I'm Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello, y'all. Welcome to the podcast. In the last episode, the Federals' turning movement had carried them to Sudley Ford and then to Matthews Hill, where they were intercepted by Confederates led by Evans, B, and Bartow. But then at the end of the last episode, the Rebels had just been driven from Matthews Hill a bit before noon, and the Union Army's commanding general, Urban McDowell, thought that the battle was as good as won. This was not, of course, how Confederate General P.G.T. Beauregard had imagined the battle would develop. He had expected McDowell would unimaginatively attack at Mitchell's Ford, straight down the road from Centerville to Manassas. Beauregard judged such a move on the Confederate center could be easily repulsed and that, at the same time, it would leave McDowell vulnerable to an attack on his left and rear. To take advantage of this, Beauregard had envisioned the Confederate brigades at the lower ford swinging around the Federal left and moving on Centerville. The attack was to be made with Richard S. Ewell at Union Mills on the far right, beginning the offensive, and then the other rebel brigades at the other fords would follow his lead, one after the other. This was not Beauregard's original plan. His original plan had been based on the assumption that Confederate General Joseph E. Johnston would march his force east from the Shenandoah Valley, and that the two Confederate armies would then catch McDowell between them and smash him. But as you guys know, Johnston didn't march east from the Shenandoah. Instead, he had moved his command to Manassas Junction by rail, thereby upsetting Beauregard's original plan. In fact, Joseph E. Johnston had arrived at Manassas at midday on Saturday, July 20th. As senior in rank, he assumed overall command, but he deferred tactical operations to Beauregard, who, after all, had been at Manassas for some time now and knew the ground and was familiar with the enemy's dispositions. Beauregard, having scrapped his original plan, worked out a new plan for the entire right of the Confederate line to cross Bull Run on the morning of the 21st, move on Centerville, and cut off McDowell from Washington. Beauregard presented this plan to Johnston at about 4 a.m. on the morning of the 21st, and Johnston agreed to the operation, although he did insist Beauregard reinforce the Confederate left up by the Stone Bridge. That was why Bernard B. and his men were moving north early on Sunday morning, as y'all will remember from the last episode. Right. So, Beauregard agrees to Johnston's suggestion to shore up the left, and then with that out of the way, The necessary orders for his cherished offensive movement were quickly drawn up and sent out to the Confederate brigade commanders on the lower fords. And so Beauregard was confident that daylight would see southern arms at his direction when a smashing victory over the enemy gathered on the other side of Bull Run. When the Federals of Tyler's division began their demonstration at Mitchell's Ford on that fateful Sunday morning, Beauregard believed the enemy was playing right into his hands and he and Johnston waited for word that the southern attack had started. But the attack orders that Beauregard issued that morning were unclear and imprecise, and in one crucial instance went undelivered. As we mentioned just a minute ago, Beauregard's plan called for the attack to begin with Richard S. Ewell at Union Mills on the far right, and then the other rebel brigades at the other lower fords would follow his lead one after the other. But Ewell never received those orders, and so the Confederate attack never even got started. As John Hennessy explains in his book, The First Battle of Manassas, An End to Innocence, quote, At 8 a.m., Ewell's brigade was still stationary at Union Mills, its commander waiting impatiently for orders from Beauregard. What happened to the courier assigned to carry the attack order from Beauregard to Ewell is not known. 
Beauregard later admitted, Our guides and couriers were the worst set I ever employed. But whatever the cause, the result was that the miscarriage of Yule's orders paralyzed Beauregard's bold stroke and put the initiative squarely in Irvin McDowell's hands. End quote. It's an interesting what if to wonder what would have happened if Beauregard's attack plan had been carried out on the morning of Sunday, July 21st. What if the Confederates would have stormed across the lower fords and headed for Centerville, even as McDowell's flanking column off to the north was still struggling to make its way to Sudley Ford? Hmm. Well, like I said, it's an interesting what if. It didn't happen, though. And as we know from last week's episode, McDowell's flanking column finally made it to Sudley Ford, two hours behind schedule, but it had been detected by E. Porter Alexander, who sent that dramatic message to Shanks Evans, saying, Look out for your left, you are flanked. And so then Evans boldly rushed over and intercepted the Federal turning movement at Matthews Hill, and Shanks Evans' embattled little command was eventually reinforced by B. and Bartow, but it wasn't enough to stem the Yankee thrust, and by 11.30 a.m., the rebels had been driven from Matthews Hill. At first, Johnson and Beauregard knew little about the escalating disaster on the left end of their line. Until 11 a.m., both Confederate commanders remained behind Mitchell's Ford, waiting in vain for Beauregard's attack plan to be put into motion. They had received E. Porter Alexander's earlier warning and could also hear intensifying fire off in the distance to the north, but they had already sent B to bolster the left, so with that help, the two Confederate commanders thought Evans could handle whatever was going on up there. But then it became apparent Beauregard's attack plan had been derailed, and also the firing on the left was growing louder by the minute. And it had become obvious as the morning wore on that the Federals at Mitchell's and Blackburn's fords weren't actually intent on attacking. So by about 11 a.m., the situation had become crystal clear, at least to Joseph E. Johnston. He realized the Federals were turning the Confederate left, and so he made a decision, telling Beauregard, The battle is there. I am going. As Southern resistance on Matthews Hill collapsed, Evans and B's commands retreated and degenerated into little more than a disorganized mob. And this really shouldn't be held against them, since withdrawing in good order while under fire is difficult enough for veteran troops, but trying to do so with inexperienced men is almost impossible. But at any rate, the situation was now desperate for the Southern cause. With the collapse of resistance on Matthews Hill, the only organized force standing in between the Yankees and victory was some rebel artillery commanded by John M. Bowden on the northern edge of Henry Hill. About a mile and a half south of Matthews Hill, Henry Hill would now be the key to the battle. If the Federals could capture it, there would be no stopping them, and the Confederates' bull run line would have been smashed. At 11.30, if the Federals had made a determined push south right after they took Matthews Hill, the Confederates on this part of the field would have been helpless to put up any effective resistance. But even though he had the rebels on the ropes, McDowell, instead of maintaining the initiative and immediately pushing southward to capture Henry Hill, he instead spent almost two hours consolidating his position. During that time, he was content to have his artillery lob long-distance fire at the Southerners. Hindsight being 2020, we know that McDowell's decision to halt and not exploit his success at Matthews Hill was a huge, colossal, terrible mistake. But at the time, he probably just wanted to make certain that he had a firm handle on his inexperienced army before it made another major push. And besides, although he would soon have 18,000 men on this part of the field, Many of those northern soldiers were faltering in the oppressive heat, and McDowell may have judged they lacked the physical and mental energy to immediately carry out another attack. Well, whatever the reason, or reasons, McDowell chose to halt at 1130 rather than immediately push on southward to Henry Hill, that decision would turn out to be a major turning point in the battle. That's because by the time McDowell halted his troops, Joseph E. Johnston and P.G.T. Beauregard had already begun shifting forces northward to deal with the federal threat. 
When Johnston made his dramatic declaration and prepared to depart for the scene of the fighting, Beauregard decided to go too, but before starting off, he issued a string of orders that stripped troops from the Confederate center and right and sent them off to shore up the threatened left flank. After Beauregard advised Johnston of his actions, which were fully approved, the two men and their staffs set out and rode northward toward the sound of the guns. Hey y'all, spooky season is here. And if you're looking for a show to whet your appetite for a little haunted history, then I'd like to invite you to check out Southern Gothic, a chart-topping history podcast that explores some of the most infamous legends, folklore, ghost stories, and hauntings of the American South. We've covered all sorts of stuff from the Bell Witch of Tennessee to the disappearance of the Confederate submarine, the H.L. Hunley, not to mention our deep dives into the local lore of some of America's oldest and most haunted cities like New Orleans, Charleston, and St. Augustine. So, if you're ready for a little good old-fashioned Halloween storytelling with a commitment to quality historical research, then be sure to check out Southern Gothic today. It's available now on all your favorite podcast apps. History never says goodbye. It just says... See you later. Edward Galliano was right when he said that. Events keep happening over and over again in some form. And that's the reason I produced the podcast My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. What is it? We take stories of history and apply them to the events of today to help you perhaps understand them better. We are also part of Airwave Media Network. I've been doing the program since 2006. That's a long time, and the show has a long name. My history can beat up your politics. Find me wherever you get podcasts. In the meantime, while Johnston and Beauregard were still waiting down at Mitchell's Ford, one small Confederate unit had been marching toward the sound of the guns, and it arrived on the scene as the battle for Matthews Hill was winding down. As Ethan Rayfuse explains in his book, A Single Grand Victory, quote, The first Confederate reinforcements to arrive at Henry Hill were the 600 men of the Hampton Legion, which just that morning had arrived by train from Richmond. Commanded by Colonel Wade Hampton, one of the wealthiest slave owners in the entire South, the Legion was a South Carolina unit, clad in the finest uniforms and equipped with the best gear that their commander's deep pockets could provide. Greeted at Manassas Junction by orders from Beauregard to march toward the Stone Bridge to support Evans, Hampton led the South Carolinians to Portisi. There, informed by a scout of the situation on the Confederate left, Hampton directed his men to head for Henry Hill. End quote. And if y'all have forgotten, Portisie was the home of Francis Lewis, and it stood near Ball's Ford. Right. So the Hampton Legion arrived at Henry Hill just as the rebel line on Matthews Hill broke, and Wade Hampton found that the Widow Henry's fields were covered with hundreds of retreating, disorganized men from Evans, Bees, and Bartow's commands. In the midst of that chaotic scene, Hampton directed his men into position near the Robinson House, which lay just to the east of the intersection of the Manassas Sudley Road and the Warrenton Turnpike. From there, Hampton could see the Federal masses gathering to the north, and his men came under fire from the Federal artillery on Dogan Ridge. As the Hampton Legion deployed near the Robinson House, they found themselves confronting an unauthorized Union advance by elements of Porter's Brigade from Hunter's Division. McDowell was still consolidating his position when this unsanctioned advance from Matthews Hill went forward. It started when the 27th New York pushed southward to clear the area along the Sudley Road of the last remnants of the fleeing Confederate defenders, but then the New Yorkers veered east to escape the fire of Imboden's guns on Henry Hill. The Federals advanced to within 200 yards of Hampton's line until they saw troops clad in gray with their flags furled. Confused as to whether the men were friend or foe, the Federals hesitated to open fire. 
Lieutenant H. Seymour Hall of the 27th New York recalled, quote, Their colors were furled, and their gray uniforms did not sufficiently designate them, as many of our own troops wore the same color. We were yet lacking in discipline, so while many of us shouted fire, others yelled, Don't shoot! It is the Massachusetts Regiment, or the 8th New York. Tall Bob Frazee at my elbow on the right of my company, with a voice like a foghorn, shouted to them, Show your colors! When they shook out the rebel flag and opened a terrific fire of musketry on us. That settled it, and gallantly and coolly we gave them the best we had. End quote. The New Yorkers and South Carolinians then engaged in a vicious little firefight that saw Hampton's horse shot out from under him and his second in command, Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin Johnson, killed. Eventually, though, the Legion's volleys drove off the 27th New York. But then Colonel William Averill, who was actually now commanding Porter's brigade, since after things got sorted out at Matthews Hill, Porter had assumed command of the wounded Hunter's Division. But anyway, Averill quickly tired of standing idly by when he could see Henry Hill was now the key to winning the battle. So on his own initiative, he led forward the 8th New York and the 14th Brooklyn. But instead of charging straight up Henry Hill, the two federal regiments veered east toward the Robinson House, just as the 27th New York had done. And then, as they traded fire with the Hampton Legion, newly placed Confederate artillery on Henry Hill hit them hard, and first the 8th New York, and then the 14th Brooklyn, wavered and then broke. But even though the Union soldiers retreated away from the punishing artillery fire, their unsupported advance had still been enough to force Wade Hampton's battered little command to finally yield its position and withdraw. As the Legion's survivors withdrew to some woods on the east flank of Henry Hill, they saw that their defensive stand near the Robinson House had bought precious time for more Confederate reinforcements to arrive on the scene. Sixteen-year-old Private John T. Cox of Hampton's Legion remembered that, quote, By this time, we didn't care much as to what happened. Our rifle fire sounded like the popping of caps, our throats were choked with powder, and we were burning up with thirst. At length, becoming alarmed at our isolated position, Connor shouted and said, Fall back in good order, men, and after we got back of the Robinson House, there was a lull in the noise of battle. We got mixed up with many strange troops, apparently in panic, and whom it was said that our fighting at the Warrenton Turnpike had saved, but just how we didn't know. After this, the Legion fought in squads, sometimes under company officers, but more often alone. Filtering down to the lower rim of the plateau, we found many mounted officers reforming tangled lines and receiving fresh troops, now constantly arriving from Lower Bull Run. I saw men and horses charging about the Henry House. Then a big, fine regiment arrived from below, and in line of battle was sent through the edge of the pine woods on the left of the Henry House. Then a big crowd of us went down into the pines and drank from a muddy pool. As we returned to the plateau, we heard a great volley of musketry about the Henry House and some cheering. By this time, there were many Confederates on the plateau, and lines of battle were forming. I looked down the run and saw many regiments hastening up to us with banners streaming. End quote. As Private Cox's account indicates, Hampton's legion fell apart as it scrambled back, although many of its members still continued fighting either in small groups or attached to other Confederate units. But just as Evans' stand on Matthews Hill had done, Wade Hampton's men had bought at least some of the time that Joseph E. Johnston and P.G.T. Beauregard desperately needed to stop the Yankee turning movement. Because while the South Carolinians of the Legion had been fighting alone there along the Warrenton Turnpike near the Robinson House, the area behind them, on Henry Hill, was a hive of activity as Southern reinforcements started to arrive on the scene. While the Hampton Legion fought off the piecemeal attacks of those several federal units, B, Bartow, and Evans sought to reform their tired and disorganized regiments behind Henry Hill. Some of the exhausted Southern soldiers paid no mind to their officers, while others proved eager to rally and rejoin the fight. But into the midst of that confusion and commotion, a long line of fresh troops approached Henry Hill from the south. It was Brigadier General Thomas Jackson's 2,600-strong All-Virginia Brigade. Jackson was coming to Henry Hill on his own initiative, 
His orders that morning had been to march north from the Confederate center and support Philip St. George Cox's brigade covering Lewis's and Ball's fords. But shortly after arriving there, Jackson heard that the situation on the left was critical, so he hastened his men toward the sound of the guns. As Jackson's column approached the rear of Henry Hill, it passed through a mass of men making for the rear. Some were wounded, but many were not. One of Jackson's soldiers remembered that, quote, the wounded commenced passing us, some with the blood streaming down their faces, some with legs broken and hobbling along assisted by a comrade, and some seriously wounded and borne on stretchers. Those who could talk told us that their commands were cut all to pieces and the day was lost. Such talk was very dispiriting to raw troops. It was calculated to make a boy wish himself a thousand miles away in bed at his mother's house. End quote. If some of the Virginians coming up were shaken by the sight of their dazed and confused comrades who'd been pushed off Matthews Hill by the Yankees, they can be forgiven. Their commander, however, was not phased in the least by the chaos and turmoil around him. Here on this battlefield at Henry Hill, Thomas Jackson was about to demonstrate the fierce resolve that made him famous. As Jackson approached Henry Hill with his five regiments of Virginia infantry, he ran into John Imboden, who was taking his guns to the rear. As Bradley Gottfried tells in his book, The Maps of First Bull Run, quote, Nearly out of shells, Imboden had ordered his battery to the rear. As they bumped their way toward the approaching Virginians, Imboden complained to Jackson about how his men had been left without infantry support. Jackson responded, I'll support your battery, and limber right here. When Imboden replied that he had only three rounds left, Jackson told him he needed guns to give the illusion of strength and that he must remain there until fresh batteries arrived, even if his guns never fired another shot. Imboden immediately unlimbered on the southeastern edge of Henry Hill, about 300 yards from the widow Henry's house, end quote. About this same time, a frazzled Bernard B. saw Jackson arriving on the field. B. rode up to Jackson and, by way of greeting, exclaimed, General, they are driving us. To that, Jackson calmly responded, Sir, we will give them the bayonet. Jackson saw to the placement of his regiments on a 500-yard front. He positioned the 4th Virginia and the 27th Virginia behind Imboden's guns in the spot he decided would be the center of his line. To their right, Jackson placed the 5th Virginia. Then on the left, he put the 2nd Virginia. And finally, on the far left of his line, he positioned the 33rd Virginia. Jackson then ordered his men to lie down. Rather than arrange his brigade on the crest of the hill, Jackson had aligned his men on the wooded reverse slope of Henry Hill. Jackson hadn't witnessed Nathan Evans try the same thing earlier on Matthews Hill, but Jackson had now adopted a similar deployment. The reverse slope of Henry Hill hid Jackson's men from the Federals gathering across the way. And then, when that enemy advanced on Henry Hill, they would have to traverse 300 yards of open ground in full view of Jackson's men. The position Jackson chose was also a good artillery platform, since after each gun fired, it recoiled below the crest of the hill, where the gunners reloaded out of sight of the Federals before wheeling the piece back uphill to fire again. When about a dozen or so more guns arrived and were sent forward, Jackson finally let Imboden depart to replenish his ammunition chests. Shortly after 12 o'clock, while Jackson formed his line, Beauregard and Johnston arrived on the scene. They joined other Confederate officers trying to rally the still-broken Southern infantry in the fields behind Henry Hill. The 4th Alabama had managed to retain some cohesion, despite having lost many of its officers. Johnston rode over to the men and made as if to grasp the regimental colors so that he could personally lead the Alabamans back into the fight. But the regiment's color bearer, Sergeant Robert Sinclair, refused to give up the flag. Sinclair declared, Don't take my colors from me, General. Tell me where to carry them, and I will place them there. Meanwhile, Beauregard was riding around, giving rousing speeches to the men. While he was inspiring some fellow Louisianans, a shell exploded directly underneath his horse, killing it. Covered with dust, Beauregard calmly picked himself up and called for another mount. 
A soldier of the Hampton Legion said, quote, I cannot describe to you the effect of his appearance. Indeed, all was changed in a moment. The men brightened up, dressed their ranks, and gave him a rousing cheer. End quote. By 1 p.m., the Confederates had taken advantage of the lull caused by McDowell's inactivity, and as a result, their situation had improved dramatically. This was due to the stand of the Hampton Legion against the unsupported Yankee thrusts, and also due to Jackson's arrival and formation of his defensive line, and also because of Johnston and Beauregard's efforts to reform the disorganized regiments that had fought on Matthews Hill. With the situation stabilized on the Confederate flank, William C. Davis, in his book Battle at Bull Run, A History of the First Major Campaign of the Civil War, describes what happened next. Quote, Beauregard asked Johnston to leave the immediate front and allow him to conduct the fight there. Johnston, as senior officer and the general commanding the entire army, should go to the rear and direct the movements of the reinforcements then hurrying to the battle. In effect, Johnston should act in overall command, while Beauregard directed the fight here on the left. According to Beauregard, Johnston objected to leaving the fight until he was reminded that one of them had to direct the movements of the entire army and that, as senior general, the responsibility lay with him. Johnston would tell a different story. He admitted that Beauregard, being the junior officer, claimed the right to direct the fight on the left, but Johnston insisted he assigned the post to Beauregard rather than being persuaded into it, and also that he, Johnston, still made all the major decisions in the conduct of the fight. I gave every order of importance, he recalled. Whatever happened, Johnston now left Henry Hill and the battle there to Beauregard while he rode to Portacy. End quote. By the time Johnston departed for Portacy at 1 p.m. to maintain control of the broader tactical situation, the Confederates had used the gift of time to forge a respectable defensive line on Henry Hill. So while McDowell had dawdled after capturing Matthews Hill, a golden opportunity to continue moving southward and roll up the entire Confederate line had slipped through his fingers. At 11.30, the Union soldiers could have taken Henry Hill with hardly any effort. But now at one o'clock, they would have to fight for it, and pay in blood for their commander's failure to maintain the initiative. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. And our recommendation this time is actually a back issue of one of our favorite Civil War publications, Blue and Gray Magazine. Yeah, we like Blue and Gray a lot. And Volume 27, Number 5, from back in 2011, was a special issue for the 150th anniversary of the First Battle of Manassas. Uh, there's an excellent article about the battle itself, written by a National Park Service ranger stationed at the battlefield, and then there's also a really helpful, detailed driving tour um, in case you're actually able to visit the battlefield. So that's Blue and Gray Magazine, Volume 27, Number 5. As always, you can find all of our recommendations on the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.blogspot.com. You can also find links there to our Facebook page and Twitter feed. Thanks to everyone who has joined those lately. And then you can also go to the website to help support the podcast, like Steve H. and Andrew R. did this past week. Thank you, guys. All right, I think that's it. Uh, so thanks for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861-1865, to 1865, a history podcast. We hope you'll join us next time when we find out how Thomas Jackson got one of the most famous nicknames in military history. But until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.